I am honored to introduce our panelists this evening. Letitia Payton is joining us from South Central Louisiana. In 2015, her teenage son was abused by their parish priest in the same parish where her husband served as deacon. Along with her husband, she founded Tent Makers of Louisiana, a nonprofit that supports survivors of clergy abuse in the Catholic Church, and she's the organization's executive director. Peter Schissel joins us from the Minneapolis area tonight. His wife, Deborah, experienced sexual abuse by their parish priest as an adult, and Peter has walked with her as she testified against her abuser in court and in her ongoing healing. Finally, Jerry Vandenbosch is a member of the Awake Leadership Team and on the board of directors. Her mother, Donna, is a survivor of clergy abuse as a teenager. Jerry was previously Director of Youth and Adult Formation at Jesu Parish and is now a high school theology teacher in the Milwaukee area. So let's begin our conversation. I will turn now to Erin O'Donnell, member of Awake's leadership team, editor of the Awake blog, and head of our Courageous Conversations team. Erin will be moderating our discussion tonight. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. And welcome, everyone. I'm so glad that we can all be here tonight so that we can listen together to the stories of our panelists. Um, as we get started, I'd like to ask our guests to share a little about their experience of learning that their loved one had been abused. And so Letitia, if we could start with you, um, what would you feel comfortable telling us about the experience of learning that your son Oliver had been abused by a priest in your parish? Well, um, I guess learning about the abuse we learned um, through our oldest son, which would be his brother, oldest brother. We have six children and, you know, we lived you know, with my husband being a deacon and us being very um, well known in our community and well known in our diocese because my husband was a younger deacon with so many ch young children. Our, our ch when my husband became deacon, all of our children were under the age of 18. Mm -hmm. So um, fine, this was never on our radar that, you know, this could be a possibility of even happening to our family. Um, and when we found out it was our, our son um, was having some issues with drinking alcohol and he was a teenager and it was not something that we, we didn't even carry alcohol in the house. So it was very unusual behavior. His oldest brother was about to get married and it was the week before and there was just so much chaos with um, our son and his older brother was like asking us what was going on. And we were just totally beside ourselves. We had actually gone to our priest and said, you know, what's going on with our son? You know, because our priest is supposed to be helping counsel us, you know, but you, you always go to your priest. And so we had even gone to him and he was like, oh, I don't know what's wrong with your son. I mean, he's a teenager and, you know, his brother went off to college, you know, so this had been going on for a couple of years. Um, so it was the week before his oldest brother's wedding and my son sat him down. He's like, you you have to tell me what's going on. And he, you know, didn't really want to, he, you know, tried everything he could, but his older brother was very, very persistent. And so it was around midnight, um, when they were sitting outside talking and he finally confided in his brother, but before he confided, he asked me, he said, please don't tell mom and dad, you know, what I'm about to tell you. And because I don't want them to know. And so my oldest son could not even imagine what was about to come out of his younger brother's mouth. And so my, he ended up telling my um, son everything. And then, so my son said, no, this, we can't, we have to go tell dad, you can't keep this mom and dad, this is too important. Um, but as we've learned, many victims want to protect their families from what happened to them. Um, so he wanted to protect his dad because also my husband, along with being an ordained deacon in the Diocese of Lafayette, my husband was also a police officer. And so he was worried that my husband would go shoot him. Like he had no clue what was about to happen. And so we got awakened in the middle of the night and we're told that's what, you know, my, well, my husband went outside to meet the boys. 
then he came back inside sobbing and I woke up going, what is going on? And then my husband just blurted it out. And that was for the rest of the night, we stayed awake, we cried. And in the morning, because my husband had a police officer background, um, first thing in the morning, he and my son just took off after being up all night long, took off, went straight to the police station, reported everything. And so that's, that's initially how we found out. Yeah. Thank you. I'm so sorry that this happened uh, to you and your family and uh, your son. Um, thank you for sharing those details. Um, Peter, would you be willing to go next and share um, a little about your experience of um, learning about your wife's um, abuse, about Deborah's abuse? Not sure, Peter, if you're there. It might make sense um, for us at this point to, um, to go to Jerry, if you don't mind. Jerry, would you be willing to tell us a little bit about um, your experience um, of learning that your mom, Donna, um, had an experience of abuse um, in her teenagerhood? Yes. Um, yes, thank you, Erin. Uh, yes, welcome. So my name is Jerry. My mom, Donna, um, she uh, was abused by uh, several priests in the Baltimore Archdiocese that started when she, like the summer before ninth grade. And um, it all happened as a teenager through her high school years. And um, I found out in a, like an interesting way, in a very long way, um, I kind of always knew about the abuse. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just because I was like a very eavesdroppy, like curious child that I was always, you know, I, there's six years between me and my brother. So I was the youngest kid. So I'm, I was always hanging around the adults and like listening in on conversations, but I didn't know, no, until after I had left my own abusive marriage when I was 25. And, um, I was, you know, telling my parents, um, you know, some of the things that were happening to me, um, literally on the way home from the airport, escaping that marriage and almost as like a reason to, I guess, maybe relate to my own experience. My parents were like, well, you know, your mother was sexually abused as a priest. Right. And I was like, yeah, I know all about that. And my parents are kind of surprised because they had never just told me before. They had always you know, it, it's not necessarily something you tell a young child. Right. Mm -hmm. And, but I was, I don't know, I was a nosy kid. So I kind of already knew it wasn't very shocking to me. And, um, so like after that initial, um, moment, it, it kind of turned into just this watershed moment of that's what our life from, uh, that point on looked like, it looked like me and my mom starting to heal, from abuse kind of at the same time, um, sometimes together, sometimes not together. And um, I think the, the strangest part about it to me has been how, um, I'm always cognizant that my mom is either watching or will watch later. So I'm like, <laughs> um, the strangest thing to me about it has been, how brave my mom has been in responding to her abuse. Like, okay, my daughter knows, my husband knows, okay, let's go, let's share it all. Let's tell everyone. And initially when I was just leaving my abusive marriage, that was not my reaction. I wanted to just close it up, get divorced, forget about it, you know, close that chapter of my life and move on. I didn't want anyone to know about it. And, um, you know, she was at the total opposite the end of, no, we need to bring this to light. It's not going to get better until everybody knows every dirty detail. And um, so I, through that, she has pushed me to just talk about the violence in my own life and talk about the violence in her life for a greater good. And sometimes it's easy. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes that's caused um, fights in my family um, between my mom and I, between my mom and my dad, between my dad and I, between the three of us. And um, in other cases, it's led to really um, enriching friendships, like my work with Awake. 
or my mom um, meeting so many other survivors of the same uh, priest uh, through different connections. Like it's always turned out better. So I hope, does that answer it well enough? <laughs> yeah, it does. It does. And Jerry, we look forward to hearing some more details um, as we get into some of the other questions um, this evening. Um, but thank you for sharing those details of your story and your mom's story. Um, Peter, I'm, I'm sorry that I missed you uh, before. You were just muted. Um, but I would uh, love to, to turn to you now and to hear um, what your experience has been of um, what it was like to learn that your wife, Deborah, had um, been abused um, by a priest. Right. We were about um, three or four years into our marriage, and Deborah had been previously married, and we had spent a lot of time talking about her first marriage and how it had crumbled and dissolved. Um, so I knew quite a bit about that story. And we were actually on our way to our local parish for a, a communal penance service. So it was either memory, it was either Advent or Lent, you know, and we were in the parking lot. We never got out of the car as we started to talk. And she started to reveal that she had been sexually abused by a priest from a prior parish who happened to be, for lack of a better word, a very good friend of mine. I've, I'd known him uh, seven, eight years before he was ever ordained. I'd known him for a long time. He was, he was a trusted friend of mine. And that would have been the last thing that I ever would have expected from him. So it was devastating that way. She had... Um, so she kind of more or less told the, the long version of the story. Um, and um, she had felt, I think, safe at that time to finally say that and share that with me. One of the reasons being he was out of the country currently and he was away because he'd, he'd been, you know, still involved with, with us as, as a friend of mine. And, um, so he was kind of out of the picture and she felt a little safer that way. And she also felt like this is just something that's between us that we've got to, we've, you've got to know about and that. And so she shared it. Um, it was obviously, I, I mean, I, it was shocking to me. It was like, you're looking over the ramparts for the enemy coming because they're all out there. And, and it's the, the guy behind you who, who snuck up on you and stabbed you in the back. Um, it just was, it was devastating that way. Um, my re reaction, so I was trying to be as, as supportive to her as I could, as she described this vulnerable position that she was in, because he had come into her life while her first marriage was, was falling apart. And she was, she was, she had actually confided in him that her husband was becoming physically abusive and and worse and and um so she was he was somewhat of a lifeline to her at that time so what i did i i wrote a i wrote him a letter i um was later described as blasting him out, out but um um this is the days this is so long ago it was before instant messaging and all those types of things phones were still on the wall so it was a letter that I wrote to him, and we didn't see him then for for almost a year. I mean, we just kind of cut off the relationship as we tried to to work on other things. But I was I was in a state of shock. To, I think for quite a while trying to piece this all together. But it was the time that she needed to to say that. I think um, early on it was like part two of of her of her divorce there was part one then there was part two which was a much darker story so. yeah thank you for sharing that story i'm so sorry about all that um i, I can't imagine what that day was like um mm -hmm. and of course the subsequent and, and did you in fact send that letter to the priest yes i did i i yeah i did and he actually came up in our later 
in the later court proceedings that he was involved in as as evidence against him i guess you would say so right yeah right. it was uh, yeah. what i could do at the time i guess um yeah yeah well, thank you for sharing for sharing that part of your story. I would really like to um, to um, have you, um, our panelists, um, describe to our audience um, what what it's like to um, love someone who was abused by the church. Um, I'm also wondering how the abuse history, you know, changes your relationship with your loved one. And so um, maybe, um, Jerry, if you could um, take that question first, what would you like our audience to understand about what it's like to love someone who has been abused by the church? Yeah, thanks, Erin. Um, for me personally, it's hard. It's hard. It's different every day. Um, you know, nobody heals from trauma, from abuse in a straight line or even in like a line that goes up and down, it's more like a tangled ball of yarn. Um, it, it's hard to heal from. And uh, it brings out the absolute worst in you. And um, I'm saying that as a, the daughter of someone who has been sexually abused and as a, myself also um, in my marriage. Um, so on some of my mom's worst days, I just hate her. I just, I hate this person. And, um, you know, I can't, I can't stay. I don't understand why this person is acting this way. I don't understand why this person's so upset, why this is yelling. I don't know why nothing is making her feel better. And it's just something I, it's like a puzzle that I can't put together. And on other days, she is my best friend and one of the funniest people I've ever met. Um, it's, it's just back and forth all the time. And it can be a little for me, for really, for my experience, unpredictable, you know, who is going to show up that day. And especially when you're a child growing up with that person who maybe at the time is not hundred percent sure of what this abuse thing your mom suffered was it, you grow up with somebody who is difficult as a mother and as a adult person you look back on that and you say she wasn't a difficult mother the church made mothering for her impossible and you know you look back and you reframe it and you try to you know take that blame off of the victim where it definitely doesn't belong anyway and put it on who it does belong, but it doesn't, it doesn't make it any easier. Um, you know, I said in my opening, I'm like, oh my gosh, when my mom sees this, what's she going to say? And, um, I love her to death, but truthfully, I don't know if it's going to be a fight or if it's going to be like, I'm so proud of you. You said what was on your heart. That's what we're supposed to do. Like the unpredictability of how that person will feel that day is difficult for children. And it's difficult for adult children too. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I just, you know, I, I love my mom to death, but um, so, some days are just way easier than other days. And it's not my fault. It's not her fault. It's just, this is what the church has done to our relationship. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's added this, this um, sort of very complicated layer um, yeah. to the mother-daughter relationship. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Jerry. Um, and thank you, Donna, for um, uh, you know giving your daughter the okay to, to be part of this event. Um, I think, um, Peter, maybe let's go to you next and you can sort of um, talk about, um, share anything that you feel comfortable sharing about um, you know, what it's like to, um, you know, to, to be in relationship with someone who has um, you know, been abused in the church. Yeah, if you value if you value where you stand, if you made a if you decided you were going to make a stand with the church in the church, I think as a punky high school kid, I I walked out and said, "This is not for me. This is a bunch of phonies. I'm moving on." And then in the 20s, I worked in the army with a number of uh, army chaplains who were an impressive lot, and 
and came out of the army with deciding that I was going to be involved in in a parish wherever I ended up and in in the church. And so you you make a decision. The faith's yours. You know, God is God. The Lord is the Lord. The Eucharist is the Eucharist. And bishops are weak, and priests are are uh, dangerous sometimes. I guess is is the lesson. Um, and you and you learn, but that doesn't. So you you know, Deborah's from a very solidly Catholic family, and mm -hmm. so trying to be gentle and understanding with how do you walk through this and what do you what do you give up on or what are you giving up on you know is a is a very difficult question and as you walk through but her courage has been very impressive to say to keep going in that relationship to stay to stay in it to keep to keep walking forward you know um I think you had mentioned on another time about the, the lamenting um you know, calling out to God when you're, when you're so helpless for the healing, you know, you don't even know what the healing looks like. You don't even know that the wounds are there in, in the cases so often until people share, you know, Deborah holding all this in and then spilling it out. Um, and, and so you want to stay where you get um, your nourishment, I guess I would say it's, it's a uh, holy ground to me. That's and so, I don't think I would be as supportive elsewhere. And um, it's been the place for us to make our stand and, and continue to to be there and and grow. And I think she, she, her especially has shown tremendous growth over these years. It's funny how when that first when she first told that story to me of what had happened, it never. It never crossed my mind once for for years and years to say we should go to the police and report this as a crime. It never it never occurred to me as a crime. Um, it was despicable behavior. Where you know nowadays or these last five seven years, I certainly would view it very differently. And in fact, later on, we did go to the police and found out that it was a day late and a dollar short for what they considered criminal. But but her testimony then came forward in, in, a, in a subsequent trial when here was the same actor acting acting out again. And they finally, um, I think with partly from her testimony, were able to to get him to plead guilty and and he served he served uh, prison time for basically the same behavior with another woman. And and you carry the guilt to say, you know, gee, maybe if you were to come forward a little more forcefully back then maybe the diocese would have picked up on something and said this guy this guy's a bad egg and we got to remove him well they didn't until until the state told them he's out you know you can't so right 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 thank you peter for um for sharing that part of your story um letitia i wonder if we can go to you next um what i really am hoping that you can share is is what you'd like our audience to understand about the challenges of loving someone who was abused uh, in the church. I, I'm really interested, I think our audience might be as well about how um, your son's abuse history has altered your relationship with him. It's as um, Peter and Jerry both touched on, um, there's a lot of guilt so the relationship, you know, as mother son, and I'm speaking for myself because my husband could speak probably in some way very much the same, but I'm speaking specifically as a mom. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of guilt there because, you know, you're, you're raising your children in the Catholic church. You're teaching them all about their faith. You're encouraging them to, you know, our faith teaches us, you know, invite your priest over They, you know, your children need, you know, especially your sons. I have four sons. So you want your sons to understand the priesthood. You want them to befriend, befriend the priest so that if they have a vocation, it will strengthen the vocation. And then this happens. And then, so now I've got to, that it, it's very difficult because as a mother, you know, my son was 16 when this happened to him. 
So I'm trying to, you know, we were trying to get him to do confirmation, which he eventually did, but he was fighting us, you know, I'm not doing confirmation. We had no clue why he didn't want to do confirmation. So we're still trying to instill faith on him, not knowing that he had been abused. Um, and so now, you know, hindsight's always 2020. We look back and, oh my gosh, how horrible it must have been for him because he wanted to please us you know, by making his confirmation, he was probably trying to act as normal as he could, but holding all of this in. And here we are thinking, you know, he's, you know, why is he drinking? Why is he being disobedient? Why does he not want to make his confirmation? Why does he not want to get a mask with us anymore? It was like overnight. It wasn't, you know, like a gradual change in him. But so now, you know, we know what happened to him and we know the reasons why these things were happening but we're still having to walk on sort of walk on eggshells because what do we, what do we tell him? Son, go to church so that you can find some healing with Christ. Well, no, that's where his abuse happened. You can't send him to church where, you know, the abuse happened because he can't walk into a church. He mm -hmm. has, uh, I mean, I can say he has walked in a couple of times for special occasions. He's forced himself to go but it's triggering for all of us because now that some of the, the children have gotten older and they know, you know, it, it's difficult because we're, we're trying to help this child, you know, who's now 24, but we're trying to instill a faith in him and keep that going to help him to understand that this was not God, God's fault. And at the same time, we're still trying to navigate instilling a faith in younger children who know what, ha who knew, or now know what happened to their older brother. So it's very, very difficult to remain Catholic, to go to church, and especially, you know, with the younger ones knowing what happened. So it really is, it's very difficult. There's a lot of guilt. Um, as Jerry said, you know, the trauma's there. It, it's not a healing on a straight line. We have good weeks, we have bad weeks. We, you know, just when you think everything's going just perfectly fine, there's something, that somebody will say or something that will happen and it'll just bring everything back to that big ball of yarn that's all tangled up. So it is very difficult. If I wish, you know, if you could just say, well, let's just go to the church, let's just go to confession, let's go have, you know, receive the Eucharist and it will all be well. It just doesn't happen that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. You know, I, um, I think, um, it would be useful for you, Letitia, to, um, to talk a little bit about what happened to your family as the news about the abuse became more public. Um, I, I know we've talked about this before, um, you know, how this affected your relationship with your church community. Um, what would you like to share on that topic um, tonight? When we first learned about what happened to our son, we begged our bishop to keep it quiet, to not bring this to the public because our son was only 16. And at this point, we didn't know exactly what our, you know, what, what was going to happen, what people were going to say. And we did not want our son to have to defend himself and say that he was not lying. Um, so as it turned out, our priest did confess within the second week, I think he confessed and gave the story and his story matched my son's story word for word. The police, you know, told us there was no doubt that my son lied about a single thing because the, our priest gave the story and it just totally matched. So having said that, you would think that that would make things easier in the community, but it didn't you know, people turned against us. They still claimed that we lied and that somehow or another we wanted, you know, you were suing the church. You were, you know, trying to destroy the church. You know, your son lied. This is a grudge that you're holding against this priest for something. And it's, and then, you know, in, in our particular story, because the priest was being removed, um, after, in between him going to jail and going to court and all this other kind of stuff, the community gave a um, luncheon for him at the rectory to help him move out. And so a lot of the members of the community went to um, talk to him and tell him goodbye. And they had lunch for him and all this other kind of stuff, which was very hurtful to us because then they told us that they did this. So we knew they did. Um, 
and and then not having any support i mean there were no deacons that came forward from the church to support my husband he'd been a deacon there were no there's a hundred deacons in our diocese one came to our, my husband's side to support him as a deacon we had two priests who came to our side and was there with us and that was it and we're in a big diocese so needless to say, you feel very alone. You're ostracized. There's no one there. You know, one of, one of the women who went to the luncheon, she called me over. She wanted to um, talk to me. She, she had actually gone and told my husband's grandmother about all this before we said a word. She didn't know. So she told my husband's grandmother. So when I asked her, she said why she went to the luncheon. She said, well, I was really worried about father i knew he didn't do this he said he didn't do this and she said they said he wasn't eating she said i was worried about his mental health and she was going on and on and then but she had known my family for many she knew my husband since he was a child so mm -hmm. i asked her I said, well did you think about what my son was going through and she had this blank stare and she said no i didn't i said did you realize that we weren't sleeping and we weren't eating and that we weren't sleeping at night thinking our son was going to commit suicide because now everybody knew it was on the news you know everybody knew and she she found that shocking so you really do it, it's and where do you go you can't go back to the community you can't go back to that community you know and we were trying to keep it from other family members we we're trying to protect everybody our whole little family mm. and so what ended up happening is that you end up being very alone in what's going on with just a very few people who come and stick with you and help you work through this and it ended up being a my bible study actually um the people in my bible study which was a multi-denominational bible study that i happened to be leading beforehand and um that that was my new community of people who came to my rescue with the exception of a couple of more friends hmm. thank goodness for that community yeah yeah that sounds really very hard Peter, I, I would like to turn to you and, and find out if you have um, thoughts that you'd like to add here. You know, as the news um, uh, became more public about um, the abuse that Deborah suffered, you know, what happened to the two of you and how did it affect your relationship with your church community? Yeah, it was very difficult. We had, um... Deborah had been very involved in the, in the parish up in the St. Cloud Diocese and had since moved after her divorce. Um, so she was in a, in a, we were both in a different, different diocese, which put a little distance between us. But um, um, the family, the family was, um, as it became more and more public, she took it upon herself to uh, to reach out to each one of the children who, who when this was becoming public, were now uh, in their 20s and their 30s, um, so mm -hmm. older, and and to speak to each one of them and to say what, to give an opinion of what she was going through at the time and the vulnerable place that she was in as, as to how this could happen and and what and what went on and uh, i think they they accepted that very well as to what where they've gone through um the younger they are the, the angrier they are at the church they the three younger ones have like no no use or time for the for the church at all and the youngest one is probably the most angry they all have their own battles with alcohol. Um, the oldest daughter is heroically living a very wonderful life with her husband and kids and living out a Catholic uh, parish experience, which is very good for her. Another case of, you know, mark out where you're going to stand and, and, and live it out, you know, and that. And then the oldest son, who said at one point, uh, I need to get my spirituality back, but the one place I can't go is back to the church. Mm. And has since then 
given up to despair and, and committed suicide. So, you know, you can't pin all that stuff on, on that, but so multiple, multiple things, but um, mm. it's sure, it's sure for what you think should be your, your place of support and solace and peace instead was a, a vice grip that that squeezed you know squeezed everybody into in such denial that, you know mm. it was a terrible time yeah oh i'm so sorry peter yeah thank you for sharing sharing that um jerry i i wonder also if you could talk a little bit about how your mom's history influenced um your family's relationship with uh with your parish yeah mm -hmm. yeah absolutely um well my mom um wanted me and my brother to be catholic to be good catholics and despite um her trauma the very serious that I don't think anybody would have blamed her for not wanting to raise us Catholic, um, took us to church, uh, religiously, um, had us there, had us a daily mass, had us in Catholic schools, um, wanted us to be good Catholic kids and good Catholic adults. And, um, I have to believe that was a struggle for her always. Um, like it must have been scary for her to sit in, you know, familiar places that have bad memories, but there was just something in her that knew like, you know, faith in God is important. And, um, I really, you, I, I didn't end up getting confirmed then until I was an adult, but I credit my mom with a lot of my own faith. She certainly sowed the seeds at a young age. And, um, but even so, my relationship with the church because of this um, terrible crime is um, off and on is the best way I can describe it. Um, I'll go through periods that are sometimes years where I don't want to go to mass. And I just say, as faithful of a Catholic I am, I can't sit at the communion table with these people right now. I can't, I cannot do it. And, um, and that, and that's been hard. Um, my mom, she, my mom was one of the women feature in Netflix docuseries, uh, The Keepers. And um, when that came out, we had two very dissonant reactions. Um, one from the community of watchers that was, wow, this is such an amazing story. Thank you for sharing this. You're so brave. All the kind of things, which my mom needed. She had never heard at that point. And then the reaction from the Baltimore Archdiocese, which this Netflix series is filled with a bunch of lies. And um, that only drove the wedge further between me and this church that is supposed to be mother church, that is supposed to be my home, that's supposed to be a safety place. And um, I struggle with that still. Um, it, 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 in fact, I, I'm pretty sure from the time in 2017 that The Keepers was released until maybe sometime in 2020, thanks to my work with Awake, I felt encouraged and renewed and refreshed and ready to go back to church. Um, but even so, I still sometimes sit there and, you know, think how empty of a homily I just heard when there's so much suffering out there. Thank you, Jerry. Yeah, I I want to just um, pause here for a second um, and turn to our audience and just remind you that we welcome your um, questions this evening. So if you'd like to ask our panel a question, um, please send it via chat to Catherine Questions. And um, I would ask that we all be respectful in how we frame our questions. Um, acknowledging that our panelists can only speak to their own family's experiences and that there also may be some questions that our panelists would prefer not to answer out of respect for their loved ones. So um, that said, um, I'd like to go now to, um, uh, let's go to you, Jerry, again. I want to ask you this. What have you found that you need most um, in terms of support as the loved one of a victim survivor of abuse, you know, where, what, what kind of support do you really crave and, and where have you received it? Yeah. Um, 
I, the support I think is the most touching is acknowledgement that um, in, in a, an extended way, the church has abused loved ones also, that they've denied us of a relationship that they, um, you know, insist must exist on the planet, right? That women must be mothers, you know, mother or nun and nothing else. And um, they, they took my mother away from me. I didn't get to have a normal mother growing up. So like I just acknowledgement from leadership in the church saying, yeah, we hurt your mom, your wife, your son, we hurt you too. And you are also owed something. Um, I have received acknowledgement, um, from groups like awake, um, awake host, a, uh, support group for loved ones of survivors. And that's been amazing to attend, to know that there are other people out there that just speak the language I speak and that I can freely say things like, I hate my mom today and I love her, but today I hate her. And they know what I mean. They know that like, she doesn't really hate her mom. She hates what's going on right now. And, you know, when emotions are high, you don't express yourself well. And it's, it's been great to find people to, with a shared experience. Um, but acknowledgement has been the most healing thing. Um, I knew for a long time, you know, for every survivor, there's at least one other person that this is devastated also. Mm -hmm. And they're out there and we also deserve and need to be heard. It's, that's the matter of justice here. Thank you, Jerry. Peter, could we go to you next? Um, what kind of support do you um, like to have, wish you had? What do you crave? And, um, and where, where have you found it? I think I found the most support up here in, in our area with the with the, the SNAP group has been uh, very informative and supportive. They've been they've been good listeners, and and it's and it's there's a sharing. And I also see that in in the ones that I've attended. You know, like with things like Awake and and what and what to their credit, the diocese here is doing for for restorative justice um, to have their their meetings via Zoom for people to talk, to hear, to know that you're not out there all, all alone by yourself, which um, having met with the Bishop up in St. Cloud last summer, I think he could walk past Deborah and I tomorrow and not have any idea who we were and, and much less reaching out to, reaching out to us or to, uh, to any of, of our family. Um, so those people, you know, the SNAP group has been uh, very, very supportive. And I, you know, it's, it's those listeners, those, those non-judgmental listeners that, mm -hmm. that are aware, you know, what the things, uh, things have gone wrong or whatever, and are willing to, to step up and listen, you know, um, that that's been most valuable to me. And I think to, to Deborah too. Right. Right. Yeah, Letitia, um, you talked about your Bible study being really an important source of support. I, I wonder, you know, as you, um, your own experience, and as you've also walked with other families um, who um, love people who have been abused, what do you think um, family members of, um, of victim survivors need most? I think what we need most, and I've heard it with both Jerry and Peter, is, is acknowledgement um acknowledging that it happened you know because for the longest time I didn't want to go anywhere I didn't want to I certainly didn't want to go to any event that was church sponsored um didn't like community events and that is so not like me I'm normally like hey you know I'm here but you know that you're walking into the room and everybody's or you have this feeling that you're walking into the room and everybody's like that's them that's the family that's the mm -hmm. mom it's her son, you know, it's her husband, you know, that's the ones. And you just don't want to have to deal with that. But at the same time, you would prefer people to just be very frank and come up to you and say, hey, I heard, I understand, 
I'm with you, you know, I support you, you know, and, and I acknowledge what happened to you. And another thing that um, was interesting in our Bible study group, because, um, you know, we had different denominations of women and what I realized, you know, it would come up here and there uh, with the Catholic women in our group, but the, the women who were not Catholic wouldn't say anything. Hmm. And finally one night I was like, uh, you know, I said, it's okay for you to say something because the ones who've left the Catholic church, they're in your churches. We're all the body of Christ. And we need you to help support us because for those who have left, they're not being healed in our own church. So it's good that you can acknowledge what has happened. You can tell me, like, I, I think just acknowledging it, being frank with it, you know, being truthful, asking the hard questions, because I certainly didn't understand trauma and how people react to trauma and what trauma actually does to a family, much less to a victim. Um, you know, now that I understand it, it's easy enough to speak with people and to help them understand the trauma that clergy sex abuse is, mm -hmm. because it doesn't just affect the victim, it, it, you know, it affects, you know, their family members and it's going to affect their children. So it's going to affect my grandchildren because where are they going to be? You know, what are they going to say about what happened to their dad? What, how did the, their dad's family respond? So this is a generational thing that we need to acknowledge and, um, and, and support the victims and their families. Did I answer that? Yeah, yeah, you did. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I, I want to turn to Peter because I, we talked about this a little bit um, another time, Peter. I wonder um, if you could share your thoughts on what the church can do. And I'm speaking of church as both the hierarchy and the people in the pews. Um, what can the church do to better serve the loved ones of um, people who have been abused? Well, I could start by admitting that the structure, the authority structure is broken uh, and not accountable. Um, Bravery is another issue for, for bishops, but what can the church do? Um, it needs to reach out. Uh, there's a new bishop coming to, you know, St. Cloud, and, and mm -hmm. within days, they could reach out to, he could make it his highest priority to reach out to the wounded, to find, to find the wounded and, and develop a, a plan to, to do something for them. Um, you know, it's the, the, divide between oh okay we've got the hierarchy and we've got the people in the pews even even to say that just points up the the brokenness of it you know paul says there's there's all these gifts there's all these roles none nowhere that i can see does he ever point to the saying and they're all in one person they're all in one man they're not they're spread mm -hmm. out through the whole the whole body of christ including everybody here and and the and the bishops need to look for that. The priests and the, and the parish need to look for that. They need to decentralize that power. However, we do that, it, it needs to be done. Uh, you know, if if X number of of your parishioners have left the church and are not coming back, you know, a CEO, if they like to style themselves as, would say, "Gee, we're failing. This business failing. Let's jump ship. Let's go somewhere else." Because Man, you're losing. You're losing all. Your, and and they don't reach out. I don't. They don't tap into this organization or whatever. Snap. Or, you know what are they afraid of? It. It's what can they do? I think they need to have some courage. They need to have some prayer. They need to have some discernment about you know who who's being ordained and and bringing everybody into that into that equation. Right. Right. Thank you. Thank you for those thoughts. Um, Jerry, let's go to you next. And I'd really like to hear your thoughts about what the church can do, um, both the hierarchy and, um, you know, the people, all of us. Um, what can uh, we do to better serve loved ones of people who have been abused? Um, it, it's, it's a difficult question. And when I think about it, my first response is, I'll tell you what you can stop doing. And it's just <laughs> praying. Um, I'm tired of hearing, um, you know, during prayers of the faithful, oh, and for the abused and those affected by it. 
okay, now what? That was nice, but nice is not solving anything. Um, I like it's going to take action. And in some cases, it's a, it probably is going to take loss and perhaps the loss of a church building, the loss of a diocese, the bankruptcy of a diocese. And um, I know that'll hurt people. And I do feel bad about that, but I didn't hurt them. The leadership caused that pain. So uh, it, uh, re accepting responsibility needs to look more like actionable steps and less like, well, we're holding this mass for victims and we're making it all about them and we're going to do it every year. And that's what we do for them. That's nice, I guess. But if that's all you're doing, it's not helping. Um, I learned a long time ago through my uh, theological education, it, prayer is not wishing. It's not saying, oh, I hope God fixes this. It's, Lord, give me the strength and peace to know what is right to do in this moment and help me do it. You know, it's an action. And um, so, like I said, it's easier to say what you can stop doing, you know, just stop just praying, like get up and do something like go meet these people, go listen to their stories, go make sure that their um, bishops and priests and archbishops know the stories that mm -hmm. until they um, can't get it out of their head because the Lord knows the loved ones and the victims cannot get this out of our heads. Yeah. Um, you know, help them share that burden. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you, Jerry. Um, I would like to, um, I hope this is okay. Letitia, I'm going to move on to our next question um, uh, just because I'm keeping an eye on the clock. Um, and I would ask um, you and, and um, Peter and Jerry to possibly um, answer briefly if you can, but I wonder if you, um, if you were to look back at the beginning of this journey of, um, you know, um, supporting your son, um, you know, from the point that you learned he was abused, what do you wish that you had known about the experience of walking with him? You know, what, what would you go back and tell yourself on day one? Hmm. I'm not really sure. I think what on day one, um, I guess I wish I had known the extent of clergy sex abuse in the church. Mm. I think that would have been helpful to us. I think um, I grew up as a cradle Catholic, but my family didn't really take us to church. We actually, um, and my husband is a convert to Catholicism. Uh, much later on, he was, he converted after, or maybe right before our third child. Um, so there was a lot we did not know. And I think that complicated things because we were so naive and we really honestly thought that when we found out that it would be so shocking that there would be immediate change that, you know, that, and I guess we didn't really know how to help our son either. Um, if I had known, we probably would not have, because we had meet several meetings over several weeks with um the diocese going you know we met with the bishop we met with priests we met with the deacons we met i mean the um, head of the diaconate and we met with our vicar general um i think i wouldn't have we would not have done so much of that because that caused much more pain um than than needed to be for our son um i don't know i don't know we our, our situation was a little bit more unique because my husband was a deacon of the church mm -hmm. and also because he had a police background, which complicated some things you would, you know, he supervised sex offenders. So why did he not see that this priest was grooming our entire family for several years? It's just, I don't know. Mm -hmm. We have to watch out for each other. That's all I can say is that, you know, I'm sure others could see it, but, you know, you just trust your priest. That collar sort of blinds you to certain things and behaviors that you can't imagine a priest would do to your own mm -hmm. children. Um, so I don't know, that's really kind of a hard question for me because I don't know. I, I think we did the right steps in the beginning. I guess I just wish that we had known more about clergy sex abuse and not trusted them so much in the beginning to offer the help that they said they were actually offering, which really just made everything worse. Mm 
Yeah, thank you. Thanks for those insights. Peter, let's go to you next. Can you, if you know, if you could go back to um, Peter, you know, on the day that Deborah shared um, her story with you the first time, you know, what, what would you want to know that day? Well, I want to know that. I guess I would have wished that that day would have happened sooner, that, that she would have felt safer with me sooner that she could have revealed that and we'd be further down some path of healing, whatever, whatever that looks like. Um, Cause that's a commentary on one of the things she said was one of the reasons to hold back was that she was breaking up a friendship between me and this priest. And I said, well, you know, you know, I wish she would have, would have said sooner that we could have, and then we could have, maybe brought this to her attention and gotten some resolve and saved other people down down the road from from his actions i guess that's what i would say yeah excellent thank you peter and jerry what about you you know um looking back what do you wish you had known about the experience and what was to come um in walking with your mom um I, I think I wish if I could go back now and tell myself anything, it would just be that like my feelings are valid here also, um, that I've also lost something in my mom's abuse. I've lost the very special um, child mother relationship that is just not going to be normal for me. And I wish I could go back and just say like, it's okay. It's okay to, you know, be upset some days. It's okay to not be upset other days. Um, all of it matters. All of it's your experience and all of your experience is treasured by God. So it ought to matter to the whole church. Right, right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jerry. So let's turn now to some audience questions. We have a lot of really good um, questions coming in this evening. And I would encourage anyone else who has a question um, in their mind um, to go ahead and share it through the chat with Catherine Hours. Um, She's in the chat as Catherine Questions. And um, I have these, uh, these questions to share with you. Um, I just wanna tell you, um, Peter and uh, Letitia and Jerry that you don't have to all answer every question, but um, I want to start um, with, um, with this one. We have um, victim survivors in the audience who have shared that they're trying to decide whether to tell their family about their abuse. And so I wonder if you could um, answer this question and maybe Letitia will begin with you. Are you glad that your son shared um, his story with you? And, and do you have any advice for the victim survivors in the audience about navigating that decision? Every family is different. And I can say that um, because my son finally came forward um, with his story, and he trusted his brother. They had a very close relationship. They're three years apart, but he trusted his brother enough to finally tell him. And there's a lot of fear that you don't know how you're gonna be received by your own family members. I mean, I've heard the, the terrible stories where families, families just were not receptive to even hearing what happened to their own children or whatever. Um, but I can say because we know, you know, for, at first it was just me, my husband and our oldest son, but that was enough to start my son on the healing process. Then his younger sister found out and, you know, there's a healing in the fact that I'm starting to cry, but that you watch your children cry together mm. and they cry together and they love each other and they support each other. So family is very very important i think to healing because that's the people who are closest to you and who should care about you the most um there was never any doubt in my mind or my husband's mind that our son was telling a lie about it we knew that he was completely truthful because i mean the, it took a lot for a family member to admit it so I think healing can begin in the family. And if you are of a close family, you may want that family support. They may be the people you trust. So, but again, 
every family dynamic is different. So I'm not sure, but for us, it's definitely healing because we all need the healing as a family. But my son knows that he can come to me. He can go to my husband. He can go to his older brother. He can go now to his two younger sisters that they all know and they are older now. So they have an understanding. So it can be very healing. Yeah. Letitia, that's so beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Jerry or Peter, do either of you want to add anything to that, um, to that question, or should we leave it and, and move on to another question? I just wonder if you have any uh, thoughts that you want to add. Um, I think for me, it's helped me make more sense of my life and filled in gaps to know what's happened to my mom and to my whole family. Um, you know, growing up, I didn't always understand why my mom was acting the way she was acting. Cause you know, as a child didn't always get the whole picture and, um, you know, that's helped filled in some of the gaps and ultimately has probably made me a more empathetic person. Um, you know, and empathy is never an easy thing that we achieve. You know, it's always, it's always the case. The most empathetic people seem to be the ones that suffered the most. Mm. So, mm. Mm. Um, Peter, I'm just going to go on and, and ask this next question. <clears throat> um, another loved one of a survivor who's um, present in the audience um, tonight asked how they can best respond when it feels like their loved one is taking their anger about the abuse out on their family members. Mm. Um, uh, you know, have any of you experienced that with your family member? And if so, do you have any advice? So maybe Peter, we can start with you with that one. I don't know if I have any advice on that. That's if you if you're in a place where you where you understand where it's coming from and you can you can absorb it, um, and you have that kind of a dialogue between that you can you can get it out in the open and discuss it and point it out. Um, mm. I mean, it, yeah, I, I, my, my first thought would be you, you've got to just understand where it's coming from and, and, and who it was really intended for. Right. Right. Jerry, I, I have a sense that you might um, have some thoughts on this one. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my, my family's from the East coast. So we're all big personalities without abuse. Um, so yeah, we, we, uh, uh, that's almost our love language. We kind of joke is just like fighting and yelling with each other. And, um, I think some, it is hurtful sometimes. Like, of course, when you're upset, you just say hurtful things to people. You're not thinking in the moment what it's going to do in the end. And I think you need to really be sure of that when you're not in an argument, when, like, when you, when you're not there, maybe when you're alone, when you're by yourself and you just remind yourself, like, this person is not mad at you. You are not the actual problem. They are just yelling about something else in your direction. And, um, I think the term that, uh, the therapist, I guess, uses like gray rocking where you just, you know, shake your head, listen, and okay, that's how you feel. Yep. Okay. Just no emotion flat. Cause you know, when people are yelling, there's, there's nothing that's going to get done useful. Sometimes people just have to yell and you have to let them. Mm -hmm. um, let's go on to another question. Um, a priest who's here in our audience tonight wanted to, first of all, express his um, gratitude um, to the three of you for your courage. And um, he also shared his sorrow for what you've experienced. Um, he, his question is really, you know, what you as family members of survivors think that young priests should know about this issue as they begin their ministry. Um, Letitia, would you like to take that question first? Um, it's hard to even as a young priest or as a priest who's newly ordained, because I would say there's sort of a difference there because if it's an older priest, if it's an older man being ordained, he would have a little bit more wisdom than a younger man being ordained. Um, he may have seen just more in life. Um, there's a level of maturity that I think you have to attain, um, both spiritually, emotionally, physically. I think it needs to be acknowledged that 
it exists in the church. Mm. Um, I think the truth needs to be told. I think they need to understand trauma because as Jerry said earlier, you go to mass and you hear, let us pray for all those who've been abused. Well, I mean, it does, it gets old. After the third or fourth time, it gets old. So if you're a young priest, you know, like just stop, do something else, form, um, form a committee. Uh, you know, there's just other things you can do. I think the truth of the problem, the fact that there has been very little change um, and acknowledging that there are family members in your congregation that may have been abused um, are those who have um, friends who have been abused and acknowledge that those people are in your congregation. I think it would also be helpful to um, understand, you know, one thing that didn't come up was, I know people would say, well, I mean, the abuse is everywhere. Well, that was not helpful to me. I understand it's everywhere. It is everywhere, but I don't want it to be in my church. I need my church to be a safe spot. Now I know that, you know, 100% perfection, it just is not attainable on this earth because men are sinful and men are weak. But I would like to know that there, it is safe enough. It is safer than the streets. You know, it's, it's much, uh, there needs to be something so that even your, your congregation doesn't find out about an abuse victim and then tell that abuser, you know, that victim's family, well, it's everywhere. I don't know. I mean, this is a good place. No, it's not. Then that's not helpful. So I think educating themselves in trauma and speaking to victims and doing something other than prayer petitions, like Jerry said, there needs to be some sort of an action because we really are just kind of tired of hearing the same old, same old. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Thank you. Peter or Jerry, do you have anything that you want to add in terms of what you would tell um, our um, priest in the audience, um, th this priest in the audience who asked about um, family members of survivors, you know, what they should know about this uh, issue as they begin their ministry? Yeah, I would like to, you know, they need to, it seems to me there's a lacking of, of discernment through that whole seminary process and into, into the priesthood you know, a lot of these guys are very, very young and haven't been out in the world. And, you know, how do you, how do you discern? You've got to be aware of, of your own motivations. I would say knowing Deborah's predator, you know, as he went through that whole process that he didn't know, had no idea or clue about what grooming was, but somehow he learned that and he learned that it worked. And it worked more than once. I mean, so and where's the where's the the oversight of of the diocese? You know, where what kind of what kind of things are in place to guard against that within within the priestly fraternity? They've got to do the policing, and they've got to say hey and call each other brothers on the on the carpet for what what's there or what's lacking in their training. You know. Mm -hmm. These bishops need to be held accountable again. So. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Thank you. Um, okay, so I have um, we're we're coming up on the end of our time. It's hard to believe that, but um, I have one last um, hard final question. And so um, I'd ask the three of you to to th consider who 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 might be willing to take this one. Um, so. We have some people in the audience who are former Catholics, and one of those uh, folks is asking, how do you think those who are no longer Catholic can be part of the work to hold the church accountable and demand restorative justice? How can those who are still in the church and those who are not work together on this? Um, I might be, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. I, I, um, I'm working with um, our state legislature on different committees for child abuse. Um, and I think that becoming active in the community and in your state legislature, now, and I understand that this is not going to be for everybody, but you can support those who are working. In other words, um, or I'll give you an example, 
Mm. I testified in front of our state legislature to um, pass, have that law passed in Louisiana for victims to have a three year window to come forward to seek justice um, civilly. Those are things that are monumental for victims because it's not that you're after the money, it's that you're after the acknowledgement that it happened to you. Um, right now I'm working with some sex trafficking groups and other groups that are working towards um, legislation to prevent child abuse. But my hope is that when I come in and work with these committees and these different groups is that they will acknowledge that one organization that needs to be looked at is the Catholic Church. Because right now, you know, we have a federal investigation going on into the diocese, the archdiocese of New Orleans for sex trafficking. So it all intertwines, you know, our priests are capable of a lot of evil things. Um, and so if we can't find the help we need, you know, inside the church to make them accountable, then we can go outside in our communities and force them to be accountable, to be held accountable and to get rid of the sex offenders because we know that there are still sex offenders, um, pedophiles, you know, whatever kind of sex offense they're doing, whether it be children, you know, young women, older women, married women, married men, they're going after them. They need to be removed and they need to be held accountable. And sometimes I, I'm noticing that they're letting these priests go in back into society, but nobody knows this. So they're no longer wreaking havoc necessarily in the Catholic church, but what are they doing to society, to our communities? They're not being held accountable outside of that. So we need to make sure that um, we can work e either in the church or outside of the church and that both there are both places that we can hold them accountable inside and outside of the church. Thank you, Letitia. Thank you. Jerry, if, if you could um, briefly, I know you want to add something. If you could briefly do so, that would be wonderful. Um, yeah. Um, what I would say to those that, you know, not don't consider themselves Catholic or left the church, that that realm of people um, to know that there are um, Catholics out there that need your support also, that you there are still people in the church that um, we do want to remain in the church and we more than respect your decision to leave and understand it's, it's completely understandable in a lot of the ways. I think those who stay are the harder ones to understand. Um, but to know that we need your support also. So just doing things like coming to these conversations to educate yourself about the different aspects of abuse in the church um, is a great place to start. Um, and absolutely, I would echo what Letitia said, um, figure out what your state legislatures are up to. And are there any bills that have to do with sexual assault, um, providing support for victims, providing windows for victims? Those things are so important. Um, there, there's a lot you can do. And of course, I can only speak for Awake. Um, Awake welcomes everybody, no matter where you are um, uh, in, in your religious, spiritual life journey. So you're always welcome with us. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Jerry, for that. And um, so I'm just looking over here. We have so many good questions that we didn't get to um, this evening, and I'm sorry about that. But um, as always, we will um, look for ways to incorporate um, some of those ideas in our part two, um, which is coming next week. So I just want to extend my heartfelt thank you to Peter, Letitia, and Jerry for the wisdom that you've shared with us um, tonight, for your courage in speaking um, your truth um, to all of us this evening. We're really grateful. Um, and so now um, it's my job to hand um, the mic over to my colleague, Kathy Ann Call. Um, our um, panelists will be back in a moment. Um, so please don't go anywhere because you'll be hearing more from them in a moment. But first we're going to hear from some good information from Kathy. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. Really appreciate that. I guess I'd like to start out um, to the panelist and as a victim survivor myself, um, just thank you so much for being here. Um, your insight and everything that you've said is so, so important. Um, and I also want to thank our audience members for their questions, because again, 
uh, shows a lot of insight and interest. Our intention here with Courageous Conversation Series is for the conversation to lead us toward action. And that is so important. Um, I am, as Erin mentioned, going to invite our panelists back in a few moments. And um, I know we've talked about some action steps, but um, I'm gonna ask them to think about, about something that is so important to them as a family member of a survivor. So let me tell you about some uh, things that we have coming up, some important announcements. Um, our next Courageous Conversation will take place on March 2nd, and it's going to be quite a bit different than what we have here today. Um, we've reached out and we are going to be welcoming Father Hans Zollner, and he is the Vatican, he's on the Vatican Pontifical Committee and for the protection of minors. He is going to be in conversation with actual survivors and of clergy abuse. Um, the event is going to be um, at a different time period also because of his ability uh, from Rome. It's going to be at 1 p.m. Uh, Central Time and 2 p.m. Eastern. So please note that unusual time. Um, and all, as always, we want you to still, um, you know, we'll record the event. And if you can't be there that day, um, you know, please still join us and um, we'll make sure that you get an actual recording to you. Um, wow, this is gonna be a pretty uh, amazing conversation. So, you know, mark your calendar, it's March 2nd. Okay. And we'll make sure that you definitely have more details about it as we go forward. Um, next, uh, you heard certainly uh, some folks mention this here. Uh, we have a few spots remaining for our winter spring session of Awake Survivor Circles. Um, and as Jerry mentioned, uh, we also have an ongoing group for family and friends of survivors. If you're interested, um, I'd urge you to get in touch with one of us, reach out because there are openings and we value everybody's opinion. Um, also a little bit later tonight, uh, we're gonna send you a follow-up email and it's going to include a feedback survey. And it's the part of this that I really enjoy because it gives you an opportunity to tell us and maybe ask questions and offer suggestions that you didn't get to do here. Um, it's also going to contain the registration part for part two of con uh, our Courageous Conversation. And we really encourage you to take the time, fill it out, because your feedback is how we create um, who we need to talk to and what those questions are. So we really, really do appreciate your helping us in this area. Okay, um, folks that are on our panel, um, we're gonna come back to you again. And um, you've given us a lot of actionable things that we can do, but let's turn back to you. And what do you think, and even if you're repeating it, that's fine. What do you think would be one action step that you think is so important that you would recommend for us to support you, okay? How can we do that, okay? Awake, we're a group that is of action. So how can we do that with you? Um, Leticia, can I start with you? Um, is there one thing on your mind um, that we can do to help you, your family, your son um, in this particular um, hard time in your life? What could we do? I think actually Awake is doing it. It's um, giving a, a place where you can tell your story, where you can listen to other stories. Um, it's, it's a safe place where people are very, um, courageous in telling their story. So 
aside from, I, I mean, I'm in Louisiana. Um, so I think, I think people learning more in, you know, across the country that this is happening, even though it's, it, it's, you know, in Milwaukee. So this is a long distance from me, but being part of Awake and knowing that, you know, these people understand, everybody on this panel understands. Um, and I think having a mother, having a daughter and having a husband is a huge asset to victims and their families because you're hearing the full story of what it looks like for a victim from all different angles. So I think that's very helpful. So I can't imagine what more other than that. I think you know more people can, um, this is a good place for more people to come, even if they are not victims or, or um, family members, but to understand what the families are going through, to understand that it's trauma and to understand that victims and their families may have just completely lost trust in the church, but they retain their faith, which is something that I think people would find hard to understand. I agree. Wow. Uh, so more outreach and um, you identified, you know, people that basically um, are interested and want to help with the problem. Um, I think that's also a really good point to mention. Thank you for that. Peter, how about you? Uh, what would you recommend for us to, um, what kind of support do you need? Um, what does Deborah need? Um, what can we do? in that position to help you as uh, you go ahead with your wife, Deborah. Yeah, you've, you've done a, a lot. Awake has been good and, and the other groups that she's been in. Um, a, a wise lady just said to me the last, last couple of weeks, um, the three things that she does is she listens, she listens without an agenda. And, and thirdly, she tethers herself to a number of people so that she reaches out to them, whether it's somebody that she needs to reach out to or that they need to they need to be in contact with her. But that's that's her action and that's very effective. And if you wanna go one more step um, on the radical thumb in your eye thing, make a copy of an awake flyer and put it in the collection basket on Sunday instead of any dollars and, and get the message sent out that way. So that the uh, parish will jump on supporting supporting this. That's. Thank you. I like that four part plan, <laughs> <laughs> really do. Thank you for that. And last but not least, uh, Jerry, what kind of action step would you suggest for us? Um, I'm going to give you guys the action step that I know my mother would give you guys um because it's important to her and truthfully it's important to me too because i see the good that comes from it call your legislators call your state representatives go to their websites go call your senators um find out what the laws are where you live about sexual assault and if they make you unhappy change vote to change them um call tell your senators why they stink um, don't be afraid to do that. Uh, you know, I, I've seen the most, so much good come out of my mom and Letitia also, um, not being afraid to get involved in politics. So, uh, I, I'm sure both me and my mom here tonight, everyone, we'd be so happy if, you know, you just learned a little more about how your state works. Wonderful. So it's having that voice that becomes very valuable. Thank Absolutely. you. Yeah. Really important. Wow, we've given our audience a lot of things to think about tonight. Um, so I guess now as we begin to close here, um, the leadership of Awake were modified uh, or motivated, excuse me, motivated by our faith uh, to do a lot of listening. Uh, we've learn to listen and learn to discern and learn to understand. And I think that's such an important area. When we gather though, we pray together. So we will end tonight with a short prayer and we will invite anyone who wishes to stay on to join us in our prayer. Um, 
We also know that there are some of us, uh, some of you that um, may not choose to stay and that's perfectly all right. If you'd like to sign off now, uh, please know that from awake, we wish you peace, we wish you goodness, and we certainly hope that we're going to see you again because we have a big job ahead of us and we need your help. So now, um, as we begin our closing prayer, let us remind ourselves that as always, we're in the presence of a God who is love and feeling that presence now, we collect ourselves knowing that the listening is an act of love. So in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you, loving God. Thank you for bringing us together this evening and giving us the gift of listening to the witnesses and the wisdom that we have heard tonight. May we hold each other in our hearts, each of us doing our part to cultivate that love and hope and healing that leaves no one out and no one behind as we continue to build the beloved community that we have. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, again, on behalf of AWAKE, we look forward to seeing you again and best wishes. Leave with joy.